start uh, the day, even though Marcelo has left the building, I think. Oh, yes, good. Uh, so what I want to do today is, is effectively really just justify the second part of, of yesterday's lecture uh, and and show you how we know that um, that there is a certain degree of irreversibility in manipulating entanglement. So of course for to show you that you already understand that I have to quantify entanglement in some way, and then I have to show you that there are at least two different ways of quantifying entanglement, both of which make sense uh, according to some uh, reasonable uh, requirements, but actually they don't agree with each other. And once I convince you that for, for two um, uh, three-level systems, say, then of course any generalization automatically has exactly the same problem. So I only need to find one example. I tried to argue yesterday that this is part of a general trend of irreversibility, where when you divide things, you tend to increase entropy. So if you force Alice and Bob not to cooperate uh, by quantum mechanical means, but you only allow them to communicate classically. So that, in other words, what this means that even if they try to communicate quantumly, your channel in between is so strong that it destroys any quantum coherence, and it only allows effectively transmission of zeros and ones. So your channel is a very strong measurement in one basis. So whatever Alice sends always projects onto zero and one. That, that's another way of thinking about classical correlations. And if you have that, then it really seems that you, ge you generate certain entropy. Or in a sense, you get less entanglement than you ought to, according to your investment. So it seems like this really is just a simple instance of a much more general irreversibility where when you delete correlations, the entropy of the universe go up. Is that the only way? Is that, is that, you know, are they really uh, one and the same completely? We don't know. So all you have to really uh, take so far as a summary is that uh, one general statement we can make is that if you follow, so we can always tell whether a state is entangled or not. And there is an essay, at least in principle, there is a criterion saying um, if you can have an operator which behaves differently for your state, and then if you can measure how it behaves for all separable states, and if you show that this is very different to what you showed earlier, then you know that your state is entangled. And this is true for any number of subsystems. This is a gen I was talking about bipartite systems, but witnessing entanglement works for any dimensionality of any number of subsystems. And this is now the, if you want one general result that's universally applicable, independently of anything, then this is it. That's the one to take uh, home with you. Uh, and all the stuff that I'm talking about now are, are, are details compared to that. So what I, what I spoke about yesterday is I said, let's say, let's say we start with a certain number of copies of some state which is shared between Alice and Bob. So again, like I said, once you know that I'm already going to encounter some kind of irreversibility with, um, with two subsystems, then of course it gets even worse when you generalize this. So this is another general result, even though I'm really looking at one particular instance of this. Um, so what I talked about is, is, that, um, is that this guy, you really... So one way of thinking about entanglement is how entangled my state is um, corresponds to how many maximally entangled pairs I can get, I can get out of this guy. And this ratio uh, is something that, that we call the entanglement of formation. Uh, of distillation, sorry. So basically we are distilling entanglement and this guy is the limit when n tends to infinity of the ratio n divided by n. And then I said you can legitimately ask the question the other way around. And you can say what if I start with some, uh, some number of maximally entangled pairs and I want to go back into, into any state. You give me some state and you say can you prepare, can you prepare this, uh, this state um, then, uh, then, then I would say, well, okay, you know, um, how do I, uh, how do I do that? I, I use some LOCC, and now I'm starting with, you know, again this state uh, as as my as my currency, if you like, of entanglement, and I've got uh, and I've got let's use some other numbers, n prime, and this goes into the state row A B, and there are n prime copies of this guy, so. 
intuitively, given that this is maximally entangled, anything else I'll be going to, I'll be getting more copies than what I invest, because I'm diluting entanglement in some sense. So you can call this entanglement of dilution, but it's the same as the entanglement of formation from another context. And, and, and now you, you have this other measure that I mentioned, which is the exact analog of this guy, uh, which says I have, uh, I have the limit again when n prime uh, tends to infinity. And again, now you, you know which one do I divide by which other one follows exactly my, my intuition. I want to get a number between 0 and 1, so that I always have something that's normalized between no entanglement uh, meaning 0 and, uh, and some entanglement meaning 1. So in this case, given that this number, I argue, is always less than or equal to that number, I should be dividing m prime by m prime. Um, I remember once when I wrote this down, I had a question saying, well, wait a second, you let m go to infinity, this is going to go to 0. But remember, m is a function of n itself. m grows as m grows. You're going to be getting more if you invest more. <coughs> it's a finite number in general. It's not a zero number, always. Um, all fine. But the weird thing, in some sense, is that these two processes, although they're reverse, they look like inverse of each other, they actually don't give you the same. So this is also LOCC. They don't actually give you the same uh, amount of entanglement. Okay, and that's something that, that I, I, I can show you formally. And then you can ask yourself, well, <laughs> intuitively, where does it come from? Where is the friction there? Why, why do I lose something? So it seems, in, the, in fact, the inequality, the inequality goes really in this direction. And that's the, that's the interesting one, that somehow I have to invest more to form a state Whereas when I come to distilling the state, I actually can no longer, can no longer um, recover my, my investment. Uh, let me tell you a little bit of a logic that may convince you where the irreversibility is. Um, uh, I, I don't know if this is really a good uh, explanation uh, in a way that, um, that you can make it completely watertight. But I think you will see roughly that, that there, is, there, is, there is something uh, that's not the same when you go backwards in these protocols. So let me describe to you how I would form a state between two parties. First of all, one party, say Alice, would create the state itself. Um, there are many ways of doing that. But let's suppose, so this is all done, of course, asymptotically. And it's only on average that they do that. I'm always averaging. I always consider mixed states. So let's say Alice and Bob would like to share a state rho a b, uh, rho a b itself, which you can decompose in some way, as I argued uh, before, as some states uh, psi a b i, psi i, a, some pure. State. It doesn't have to be eigen decomposition. Really think of it, because all of the decompositions are the same. I should be able to pull uh, off the same trick. In any, in any basis, it shouldn't make any difference. Now, what Alice does is Alice has many qubits, and of course she wants to, uh, she wants to, actually she has many pairs of qubits. Let's say they're qubits, again, the same logic goes for any dimensionality. So here are these pairs of, of qubits, and somehow what she starts doing is she starts preparing different pure states with different probabilities. So it's again uh, tossing a coin, if you like, and preparing the, set, the state subsequently. You know, you do one of those, uh, uh, whatever it's called, uh, Monte Carlo methods, and depending on your probabilities that come out, you prepare the corresponding state. So you, let's say you toss a coin, it's heads, and you say, that corresponds to me. This is all analysis side. She can do whatever she likes. She can prepare as much entanglement as she cares to prepare. There is no limitation. There is no second law of entanglement processing there. And she prepares state side 1, A, B. And asymptotically, not to bore you too much with this random way of preparing, asymptotically, what she really is going to do is she's going to prepare n times p1 copies in state psi1, because she's going to have to reproduce this average. Okay? Then she's going to prepare n times p2 copies all in the state psi2. Uh, 
A, B. That's how you would prepare, and so on. Okay? The final one is N times P, whatever is the, the last N there, and these states are in some state, psi N, psi N. All two, all bipartite states. And now you're saying, well, okay, that's all nice and, and fine. And in fact, if you didn't know, so Alice has, has, a, has a good memory in her head. And every time she prepares a state, of course, she knows which state she prepared. So she doesn't really have this guy. She only gets this guy if she su suffers a serious form of amnesia. So she loses all the memory. She goes back to Cubits and she says, oh my god, which pair did I prepare in which state? And then, of course, we all know, or, you know, she suffers a fatal car accident. Her husband comes along and says, I have no idea what my wife did there. I wish I could extract that information. I could get all the money from our joint bank account. But I cannot. So if you think of that, then every state quantum physics would tell us is of this form. So for someone who doesn't have the extra memory, Alice does know. Alice knows that this many were prepared in this, and it's really the first n times p1, and so on. I'm emphasizing this information because I'm going to claim that this is going to get lost, and that's going to be the irreversibility why you won't be able to go back. And somehow it's natural that this is the case. So in, in a way, it's very natural in equality. You should almost expect it if you follow the logic of my argument here. Now, what does she do? She says she's going to teleport. That's the easiest thing. She wants to teleport to Bob, half of these guys. That's how they're going to end up sharing. How many and type of pairs do they need to share Okay, to teleport them? Okay? And you say, well, as many as the qubits here. Yeah, but remember data compression. I'm now really, really being very careless. I could compress this information. I could compress each of these pure states locally. By how much? By the entropy, reduced entropy of this pure state. So rather than using this many, this many qubits, what I really need to use is I compress it locally. Remember, for large n, this is a unitary transformation. I'm not losing any information. So how many of these guys I really need is n times p1 times the entropy, let's call this rho b1. So this is the amount of entanglement in the state <coughs> psi1. So this is the same as entanglement, because for pure states we know that this is the one and the same in this state. Okay? The same for the other one, the same for the third one, and so on. Okay? So this is how much entanglement they need to share. What she does now, performs a bell measurement everywhere, picks up the phone, tells Bob the outcome, and Bob's qubits end up being in the same state. Bang! They created the, sh uh, the, the shared state that they wanted to create. Okay? I still haven't answered the question, what's the minimum effort that they can do this to? Here I'm saying that the minimum effort is n times sum of pi S of rho B I or A. Doesn't matter. B or A, it's all the same. You can view it the other way around. Okay? Here is how much effort she has to invest. But I started with any decomposition. If I really want to minimize the effort, I should choose a decomposition which gives me the smallest number there. Hence entanglement of formation. Now I'm proving to you why the two are the same. So if I minimize this over all possible ways of decomposing this state, I'm going to get the least number of entangled pairs that Alice and Bob have to share in order to share ultimately this state here. Okay? So that's the logic. Great. Now they're sharing that. Alice has got in her memory which pair is in which pure state. Because she used this minimal, did not now go back and say, so what Alice should really do is she should use the minimal decomposition already to start with. Now let's imagine that this is the minimum already. And she prepares it. She still knows which state she prepared uh, here. 
So you can say when this guy gets to Bob, she knows that they are no more, they are not really sharing this mixed state. They're sharing the psi one state. She's got the extra information. So if they were to go back and distill, they can do it reversibly. You can bet they can do it because they are always sharing pure states. Alice picks the, picks the phone up and says, oh, Bob, I'll let you in on a secret. The first pair of qubits is not state road, it's state psi 1. I know it. I made it. Okay? So you can see that everything is nice and, re and reversible in this picture. But this is not how I defined this distillable entanglement for you. When you talk about this distillable entanglement, there is no knowledge about the decomposition of the state. So in order to, to, to genuinely reverse this in the way that I define it here, I have to kill Alice, I'm sorry. I have to bring in a new Alice. I have to delete her memory. And now, even Alice no longer knows which of the pairs is which of the pure states. Hence, entropy increase. Actually, you can account almost. So, if you added that entropy increase to the distillable entanglement, you'd get something that's an upper bound to the entanglement information. So, actually, the difference between two, these two almost can be accounted for by some kind of irreversible deletion of, of information. So in a way, you should expect that. It was a big surprise when, when we found this result, but somehow if you think a little bit more about it, uh, this makes complete sense. Okay. Now, um, so there is a formal way of, of proving that, which probably I don't want to bore you with. I can actually use that word as well. Um, one other thing that I said yesterday, uh, which, which I didn't substantiate, is that one of the ways of dramatizing this even more, it's still a special instance of, of what I said here. So the main result is that uh, you need to invest more than what you can get out. And somehow this is because of a certain loss of information in going between the formation protocol and the distillation protocol. They're not actually inverses of each other. If they were genuine inverses of each other, I could do it perfectly back and, back and forth. Why? Because effectively I'm talking about a pure state distillation ultimately. I know each of the pure states, and I showed you already that the pure state, uh, that the pure state can be reversibly transformed. So one particular consequence of this statement is that the states that beautifully exemplify this kind of um, difference are the states where you definitely have to invest some entanglement, but you definitely don't get any entanglement out. Okay? So basically, you've got a, you've got a state. Uh, so there exists a state uh, of two subsystems. I'll, I'll make this comment in a second, actually. Such that, such that entanglement or formation of this state is, is definitely positive. Uh, and, but at the same time, you can never get any distillable entanglement. I want to show you how this, how this is proved. Actually. If I find one such state, that's already a nice, a nice thing. It's unusual. Um, but, uh, but actually, you can find many families of these states. And we have nice ways of actually, the way I will present it is actually to show you how to find, how to construct these guys. So there, they conform to their inequality. They're not more surprising than their inequality. But somehow, they extremize it. You really cannot get anything out. It's not that you get less out than what you invested, but you now get absolutely nothing, even though the state is definitely entangled. And so these are these bounds bound and tangled states. Like I said yesterday, we are very ambivalent about them in the sense of whether they are at all useful for information processing. So, you know, for example, questions like, can I still have an exponential speed up in, in, in Shor's algorithm if I use only a bound and tangled state? It's an interesting question. Uh, we have no clue, of course. I mean, we don't even know many easier questions than that one. But this one certainly is not answered. Um, can I violate Bell's inequalities with these states? Like, even if they're not useful, can I at least confirm non-locality of these states? No, we don't know whether this is possible or not. And all of these questions, I mean, almost anything you ask about these guys, other than what I will say, uh, is actually not, uh, not really understood well. So how does this work? Um, so you need two ingredients here. 
First of all, you need to find a state rho a b that is entangled, so in a way is not separable. Let's phrase it like that. So in my language, that means it's entangled. But if in your language, entangled means finite distillable entanglement, then this state is not entangled. That's why I'm trying to avoid that confusion. So this state is inseparable, OK? So in other words, it takes a little bit of effort of this type. And it certainly takes some shared entanglement to create the state. You can't do it without teleportation, OK? Alice and Bob cannot do it. Uh, it's not separable, but this is not detected by the partial transposition, and that's the key thing there. So basically, rho a b, remember I was saying partial transposition is a very good uh, indicator of entanglement for two qubits. It's really necessary and sufficient. If it fails, then the state is entangled. And if the state is not entangled, then this is not going to fail. So if I transpose b or a, it's, it's exactly symmetrical, uh, then this guy is not going to show any unusual behavior. So these bound entangled states are unusual in that they, they are entangled according to the separability criterion. And yet, the partial transposition now fails. So this is now telling you that partial transposition is not all, uh, all that good. And in fact, it's a statement I made before. But there is, I will give you now a formal proof of a state where, where this fails. They're very nicely constructed, and, and it's very intuitive how this goes. Um, all I have to now show you is why a positive partial transposition implies that the entanglement of distillation is zero. OK, I'm going to do that in one line. But first, I'll give you an example of these states so that I just don't keep you guessing. So again, you need two three-level systems simply because anything smaller than that, the partial transposition is necessary and sufficient. And it's necessary and sufficient because of the choice decomposition, which says that any positive map can be written for, for 2 by 2 and 2 by 3, can be written as a completely positive plus completely positive and a transposition. That's the guy that fails when you have when you have two three level. You can't do that. And if you fail to find the decomposition, then you can no longer make the connection between witnesses, which are Hermitian operators, and, and partial transposition. That's the guy that fails, if you like. So now, what, what I'm going to do is the following. These are, called, these are the so-called sausage states. I like that name, actually. You will see, I mean, they look like sausages. And they're really nice, nice, nicely uh, represented in this, um, in this picture. They originate from a, from a different problem, related but different, and it really doesn't matter how they originate ultimately. But what, what I want to do now is I want to choose five states of these two, uh, two Q-treats. There are nine orthogonal states there, you know, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, and so on. So 3 times 3 is the size of the total set of states. But I'm going to choose only five. Here is one of those states. How am I going to read this? 0 for Alice. This is Alice's side. This is like a matrix in some sense. This is written like a matrix in an unusual uh, representation. So basically, what this says is that my state is 0 for Alice and an and, and equal superposition of 0 and 1 for Bob. Okay. The next state is this guy. This is 2 for Bob. But it's 0 plus 1 for Alice. And you get the idea after this, I guess. Here, here, and here. Five states. This state in the middle is 1. That's a product 1. This is a product uh, state. And each of them is a product state. So if you like, this guy here is, again, 2 for Alice, okay, and 1 plus 2 for Bob. Okay? And then the final state is 1 plus 2 for Alice. And, and basically 0 for Bob. So I'm trying to mix them somehow. I'm trying to not to write them in the same basis on both sides. I'm saying if I use, if I use one state here, I'm going to use, an author, I'm going to use a, a complementary basis here. And likewise, I'm trying to, to, to populate them as much as possible. Each of these states is a disentangled state by <coughs> construction. It's a product state. This is, this is the so-called unextendable product basis. 
unextendable refers to the fact that I can find no more <coughs> states of this type in that subspace. So if you now say you've given me five orthogonal states, give me, give me four more, you're telling me there are nine states. The four extra ones have got to be entangled because I've populated all the possible local states. Anything I write now down but that's going to be orthogonal to all of these has got to be superpositioned of some of these states. So there are four more. Of course, you have infinite choice in how you choose them. Still an infinite space, okay? But none of the, the other guys is a separable, a product state. So entanglement lies here. Four of them, and they've got to be entangled. And that's your basis. It's one basis. There are many, but this one is a nice one. And it's a nice one because of the following. Uh, statement. If I write my density matrix as one minus, so if I'm, if I'm somehow now thinking of combining identity matrix, actually there is an even, there's, there's quite a lot of freedom in how I do this in the sense that I can even tune uh, probabilities differently and that's what gives me a class of bounded tuple states. I'm just going to write one down and I subtract these guys, okay? I don't know how to call them. Let's call them S1, S2, S3, S4, S5, so I don't have to write all of them now. If I subtract them like that, the product guys, okay? So the I goes from 1 to 5. I'm going to make the following claim. This state is entangled, and yet it's got a positive partial transposition. Why is it entangled? Because I'm excluding the disentangled states from all of the states. Whatever remains is entangled by construction. I can't not have it entangled. I'm in the entangled subspace of these three qubits. So the way I constructed it is already a witness of entanglement. I can write it as an emission operator if you like, and yes, it's going to be negative, whereas all the separable states are going to be positive. So I can phrase it in that way. But it's already constructed. That's why this is an intelligent way of doing things. It has a positive, uh, it has a, so if you calculate the, the, the transposition, you will see that you're never going to get a negative number. Because when you trans transpose a product state, nothing funny is going to happen. Funny things happen, negative numbers occur only when I transpose entangled states. So this guy is not going to change. Any separable state stays separable when I partially transpose it. Identity stays identity as well when I partially transpose it. So whenever I subtract one from this transposition, I'm going to have a one here to counter that guy. And there is no way that I'm going to get something less than one minus something equal to one, in which case I get a negative number. So I've constructed it in an obvious way again that it's clear that the partial transposition has got to be a positive number. So this is an entangled state, amazingly enough, but not witnessed. Witnessed by construction, if you like, but not by partial transposition. So rho, rho, uh, rho AB, this is my rho AB, one of many. So like I said, you can also put some probability here, 1 minus p, and there will be a range of probabilities for which this, this is going to hold. So this state has, by construction, a positive partial transposition. But it's not equal, again, by construction, as I argued, to any separable state. Okay. Now, the only thing I have to convince you, so you can now do this. This unextendable product basis, so to speak, works for any dimensionality. You give me a hundred dimensional system and another hundred one. You exhaust all the product states and you write 95 of them. And the five that remain to complete the whole thing, I'm not doing my math properly here, but you're getting the idea. The five that remain are by construction then uh, entangled. Because you can no longer extend this. You can try it, but you will never find the product state there. So, so this is all nice and fine. And now what I, what I really want to show you is why, why does this guy, positive partial transposition, imply that you cannot distill any entanglement? And when I show you that, then I think we we'll go and have a, have a break. 
So why does positive partial transposition imply the zero distillation? Um, now we know everything about CP maps, locality, and all of these things. It's nice and beautiful that I can really do this in one line for you guys because I don't have to, I don't have to argue for anything in what I'm going to write. What is the most general operation that Alice and Bob can do to squeeze out um, maximally entangled state out of, or any entangled state out of the initial state? So they start with some state, rho a, b. You could, be, you could even be more pedantic. They really start with m copies. But doesn't matter. Think of it as rho a, b, and think of it that it's multiplied many times. Let's just simplify the notation. And what I want, ultimately, is that some local operation is going to result in a maximally entangled state in this case. But like I said, any entangled pure state will do the job for this argument. So what, what is the form of this? Well, there has to be at least one operator of this type that does it. I don't care how little the probability is. I just want to have it with any probability. Because asymptotically, that's going to give me some finite number. Alice does something, Bob does something, and you already know that it has to look like that. Okay? I'm not summing up over the index. I'm not normalizing it because I couldn't care less. It's not important, the normalization for my argument. What's important is that any local <coughs> operation has got to have terms of this type. Alice makes something, Bob's make, Bob makes something, and because of complete positivity, I have to write it in this, in this form. You say, what about the other guys? I don't care. If I can distill, then there is at least one of, but there may be hundreds of these guys which do the job. But there has to be at least one, and I will show you that there cannot be anyone. That's the point. Now, if I rule one of out, I rule all of them out. That gives me maximally entangled state. Let's even write it like that. One over two, root two, zero, zero, plus one, right? Now. What's the probability for this to happen? Trace of A cross B rho a, B, A dagger cross B dagger, okay? You know, if you put these guys on the other side, it will look like A dagger A cross B dagger B, the form that you're used to, used to trace. That's the probability. And I just want it to be finite. I don't care how bad it is. 10 to minus 55, I'm happy with that. I live with that, okay? I want to show you that it's zero. That's the point. You cannot have it finite. Now, what I'm saying is that this state is starting as a positive partial transposition state. Okay, that's one of those bounded parts. And yet, I know it's entangled by construction. That's the, that's, the, that's the interesting thing. So what I have to show you now is that, first of all, this guy has a negative partial transposition. It's a maximal entangled state. We've tested it before. If you do a partial transposition here, you will get one of the eigenvalues to be minus a half. This guy is definitely a half. I mean, it's a state of two qubits. It's got to be testable by partial transposition. Okay? What this means, because I'm saying that this guy is proportional to that guy. Why am I not saying equal? Because I can't be bothered to normalize. I don't care what the probability is. It's proportional to this state. Now I take partial transposition of both sides. I already know this side is negative, which means this side has got to be negative. Okay, now I'm going to work my way down all the way to the row guy. Okay? So how, what does transposition do on something that looks like that? You all know that if I have, that if I have a product of operators, I take the transposition, this is the same as that. Just like Hermitian conjugate or any other operation solves the operators and, and, and does the transpose on that. And I'm going to do the same for these guys. And what comes out is A cross B, this commute, transpose dagger, or dagger transpose, makes no difference. Everything, like I say, that you want to be true is usually true in mathematics if you're a physicist. You just happen to be always like we are. So you can commute whatever you like, don't worry about it. A, B, transpose over B. I'm not saying transpose over B because I am transposing B only. It's a product state. 
I had to swap them because the transport swaps, but the middle guys always stay in the middle, no matter how much you're swapping. See how beautifully physicists do mathematics. They don't have to divide anything, guys. That's the beauty. That's why I love it. Okay. I'm never going to change two minds. Okay? And this guy is now basically this guy transposed. Again, I'm only transposing that guy. Super. Now, personally, I don't care what operator this is. Let us swap them. Still a completely positive map. I mean, write it as A tensor product B prime. Okay, I call this guy B prime. Row A B A dagger tensor product B prime dagger. Still the same form. Okay. If this was negative and I have a completely positive map, it would have stayed negative all the way through. And if it starts as positive, and I have completely positive map, it's got to stay positive. But it's not. It's negative. I'm asking it to be negative. I want the maximal internal set. Therefore, I can't do it. There is no set of operations A and B. Okay. So if I start with a positive partial transposition state, because of the form of these guys, what I, all I'm doing now is applying the CP map on this guy. I've got to produce something with a positive partial transposition. But that something has to be equal to something that I want to have a negative partial transposition. Sorry, mate, you can't do that. And the consequence is there is no such local operation. So this state cannot be this very beautiful. This is very simple. Okay? This is uh, two PRLs, one after the other we can probably deliberately separately so that it maximizes the number of PRLs. Okay. It's very simple. And so here is, here, is one, uh, here is one such state that I wrote down. But like I said, if you fiddle a little bit with, with numbers here, and you say, well, you know, I want to put some probability distributions here, PI, and maybe I want to put lambda and 1 minus lambda there, you will see that there is even a whole class of states that behave in this way that they cannot be distilled but they're still completely entangled. Okay? And this is this famous bound entanglement. So it may well be that the name is really appropriate, and in the same way that you can never use bound energy in thermodynamics to do work, you can only use free energy to do work. Whatever is bound in, in some kind of interactions there, you cannot really extract uh, according to that theory. Maybe this is the same. Maybe it's bound in the way that you will really never be able to do anything useful with that. Not even distillation. So you can see, for example, that, uh, that you shouldn't be teleporting with this many times. Because for teleportation, you really want to maximize it to have states like that. So the best way, if I give you a non-maximal entangled state, is first to create a state like that, and then teleport perfectly. But you can't do it with this guy. This guy never gives you these guys. This logic goes over and over again in, uh, in this way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a break. When we come back, I'll, I'll, I'll summarize what we've done within this part. And I'll summarize it with a view of trying to help you score a maximum number of points on Monday between 10 and 12. I'll turn into a very Machiavellian person and forget the beauty of physics and assume the beauty of exams in some sense. And then I will start to introduce the next part of the course, which is going to be really about quantum computing. It's OK? We started um, the whole uh, entanglement uh, story with uh, with, uh, with saying that historically Bell's inequalities were the first big um, breakthrough in the sense of um, converting to lots of philosophical debates that um, preceded it, I think, for um, 40 years, more or less. They converted that into, a, into a, a quantitative statement, which says it's either like this or not like this. And, uh, and in a way, in our, from our perspective, this was, in, a, in some sense, the first entanglement witness. Uh, Bell's inequalities do more than that, because they, 
they they require they require uh, Alice and Bob to be very far apart, uh, and if they are violated, um, they they basically don't really prove quantum mechanics. Uh, what they disprove is any local realistic theory. Uh, so it's not as much about is quantum mechanics correct or not, uh, but does quantum mechanics contradict this statement? There are many other theories that will contradict Bell's inequalities, and that's the power actually behind these things. That if I come up with a with a new theory and I say here are two black holes, you know, and look, I'm writing down some kind of quantum gravity version of uh, of my own, and and then a, a very a very skillful experimentalist can rotate black holes and do whatever it takes to uh, violate Bell's inequalities, um, while my theory uh, does not violate them, then um, even though my theory is not quantum mechanics, it's some other theory, I had to quantize gravity, I mean, I changed everything, okay, I really worked hard on it, uh, this simple test will still disprove it. So it's not really quantum mechanics versus classical physics, it's local realistic versus anything else that's not local. And it's the usual way that science works, you know, our statement, uh, statements are only negative statements about the world. When, so you cannot decrease entropy of a closed system. And if you come back to me and say, what can I do? I have no idea, don't ask me. What can you do? I can tell you what you cannot do. I don't know what you can do. Because it's an open-end universe. Maybe tomorrow we discover more things. And physics is always like that. I can't communicate faster than the speed of light. How much can I communicate? I have no idea. But you can't do faster than the speed of light. And all the laws of physics are really phrased in this very beautiful negative way that we tell you what we, what we definitely know is not the case. Okay? So, you know, um, we know that uh, humans are uh, uh, not different to animals. What are they really like? Where do they come from? I have no idea, but I tell you that we're not really different to apes. That's another way. And actually the whole of science works in a, in a way to eliminate the negative hypothesis from the rest. And of course you have to live with the rest of the uncertainty. There are, certain, there are many things that, that are left open in this way. Now, as far as you are concerned, I would really just make sure that, that you understand the Bell's inequalities, the ones that I wrote down with two operators, and I would really make sure that you know how to quantum mechanically calculate calculate the expectation values. I mean, it's something probably that by now you know how to do, but if I give you some product of two operators, and if I give you some state in which to calculate this stuff, then certainly this would be something that I think uh, is, is easily testable. Because Bell's inequalities are all about showing that something like this is not really equal to the average of A times average of B. Remember that I was saying stuff like that. Then basically we moved on and we said this is not the whole story because there are states that are clearly entangled but they don't violate Bell's inequality so I have to do something better than that. And then we went into the whole story of entanglement witnessing. And again, the crucial point there is really that uh, partial transposition works when you have low dimensional systems. Anything else really requires you to find a suitable entanglement witness. And I gave one example of an entanglement of an entanglement witness that was that was uh, just a product of uh, Pauli matrices in x and y direction, and this is something that for entangled states um, has a much higher value, if you like, uh, in absolute sense than, than any separable state can achieve. So make sure that again, calculating any of this and understanding any of this links back to the same issue of Bell's inequalities. It's just that here I'm removing the constraints of locality and reality, and I don't really talk about it, I'm talking about numbers. Is this number five, while well, all the other numbers are less than four? It's very, it's very simple. So that really is the main message. That witnesses of entanglement are emission operators that cut the set of states into separable states and entangled, <laughs> and entangled states on the other side. And I think that really is the that really is the main message from that. So I think, make sure you can, so there are certain things I would never ask you in, in, uh, in even in my dreams. 
So all of these proofs like show that uh, relative entropy doesn't increase under they, these are really very technical and very long. And I, you know, I, I, I'm not uh, I'm not into torturing people. I think, uh, and unless Marcelo does his own free translation of my English questions, I think uh, you will be happy with this kind of stuff, probably. Um, that summary before I before I start the new thing, I'm really going to restate what what we finished with, but in a slightly different way. The summary was that I've given you an example of at least two measures of entanglement. So basically the summary is that the fact <laughs> that we discovered that Bell's inequalities are not the final word. And then we started discussing other ways of measuring entanglement. And then we were thinking maybe we didn't know what we were doing and we were coming up with lots of different ways of doing it. Now we have a mathematical proof that actually we cannot do it with one way only. There is no one measure, unique measure of entanglement. And the last lecture was really a proof of that in some sense. So we had states for which two measures which are reasonable. Now why are they reasonable? Well, what, what, what does it mean to be reasonable? Okay? And, and I thought a lot about this when I, when I started my PhD because I really wanted to do for entanglement what Shannon did for, for, um, for entropy and I wanted to finish my PhD by giving a unique measure of entanglement and I thought that was a good punchline. Uh, but of course I was robbed of, of my punchline exactly by realizing that there is a finite gap between at least these two measures of, uh, of entanglement. So, so, in, so in a sense you shouldn't be striving towards that. So entanglement should be zero if the state is not entangled. I mean that's obvious. If you fail something like that, uh, but then, of course, the, the, the subtle point is what do you mean by entangled? Because you can satisfy this definition by kind of wiggling around and changing your definition. So I would say if, if rho uh, is separable, and that's now the definition, now you're avoiding this thing about distillable entanglement and so on. So that really sounds like a reasonable condition. And um, the second reasonable condition is that for pure states, we know that there is a reversible operation. And we know that the reduced, uh, <coughs> reduced entropy is actually a good measure of entanglement. So if you have something like psi AB, and we look at the entanglement of that, that should really produce the, I mean, okay, something times entropy plus something else is also fine. I call that an affine transformation. But it should be somehow proportional to either this or that, which is the same number. Okay, so that also is reasonable. These two are reasonable. Um, and, and now you, you ask yourself, well, what, what other conditions should I have? And, and something that I call the, third law, uh, the second law, now it's going to be third here, unfortunately. The second law is that if I have any LOCC, so if I have entanglement of a state rho, and if I make some LOCC on this guy, then I should really not be able to increase this entanglement. Again, this is phrased in a much more strict condition in the sense that even if I look at my outcomes, and I know which state I have, then even on average I cannot do that. But I'm going to just write it in a simple form so that you're not uh, uh, worried too much about it. So entanglement before I do my LOCC, this is a simple consequence of the data processing inequality I keep talking about. And you can prove it with the relative entropy. So, so whatever you do to the state, it's only going to make it worse in the sense of entanglement in this case. So that's why relative entropy is, is a nice way of, of, of capturing all of these times. Um, so again, that's a reasonable condition. Now, you, these three I knew don't give you any, any unique measure. And in fact, we know it now from our lecture that both entanglement of distillation and formation satisfy all of these three. You can prove that formally, and yet we know that they are different. For example, on bound states. You can, you can, ask, um, you can ask other things. For example, it's very reasonable to have continuity of a physical measure. So if I change my state row by a little bit, then I'm, I'm saying that, uh, that, um, that E should not change by too much. Okay? So uh, a very dirty way of writing that, uh, if you're a physicist, you'll probably be happy, is that if I change row by delta rho, what does delta rho mean? One of the parameters in rho I'm going to change by a delta, or a few, or whatever. I'm going to be within certain bound of that then this should really be equal to um, entanglement of rho plus some delta entanglement. 
I should really use epsilon because that's epsilon and deltas. But what I'm saying is when the state changes by a little bit, your entanglement measure shouldn't jump dramatically because that makes no sense. How would you explain that in nature? Makes no yeah, it's got to be continuous. Everything is continuous in nature, other than phase transitions, I suppose. But only in the infinite limit, by the way, which is not physical. That's another topic. Um, and now I say, okay, uh, so unfortunately, even these four conditions don't give you a unique measure of entanglement. And now you can go into fancy stuff. Um, but whatever I add will actually not make it unique, and that's what's really depressing, okay? In, 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 in some sense, if you like uniqueness, but if you like diversity, biodiversity, then you'll be very happy. For example, you can say um, you forgot one very important condition of uh, Shannon's, which actually gave him, in fact, this is the condition, which says that if I have a product, um, then it should be additive. So why not, if Alice and Bob share two states, why not say that the entanglement of this is entanglement of uh, sigma plus entanglement of rho? Fine. Some of the measures satisfy this, um, but again, you don't come uh, close to a unique measure. In fact, you have infinitely many measures that satisfy all of these guys. Um, so, you know, the, I mean, I'm just listing these, uh, these uh, requirements so that, so that um, so that, uh, so that you see them. Now, here is probably the, the, the most dramatic way of, of, of stating how different all of these guys are. There is a very simple way of seeing that if you have two different measures for mixed states, and of course for pure states as well, there are special cases, then either they coincide or they can invert the amount of entanglement for two different states. So here is what I'm saying. Even if I have to live with different measures of entanglement, the least I'm hoping for, and I'm not going to get it as you're anticipating, is that if I have two different states, then every measure will confirm which is more entangled than which other one. That's the least I'm asking. I don't care what the numbers are. As long as one entanglement measure, if this happens for one, then I want it to happen for the other one as well, and all the other reasonable infinity many of them. And I'm going to show you that sadly this is not the case. Um, and in fact, the statement is like this. Either they coincide, so either they, are, they give the exact number um, <coughs> for these states, meaning E1 is the same as E2 for row 1, and E1 is the same as E2 for these two and for any. So either they completely give identical answers, or there must be examples where they're going to give the opposite direction. Given that I know that distillable entanglement and entanglement of formation satisfy all of these guys, they are reasonable. And given that I know that they are not the same number, because bound entanglement gives me 0 for one and not 0 for the other, I know that they behave like that for some states, and that's disturbing. So they don't even agree on what's more entangled than what else. So if I put formation here, then you can bet that distillation is going to invert it. For some states, there exist states like that. And that's the, that's the probably most dramatic way of saying that both of them are OK. I mean, they satisfy anything you can think of. They, they agree on few states. They give you zero for whatever separable states, whatever else you want there, in some sense. The main thing here, actually, is that they agree on few states. And I will show you why, how the logic goes. So basically, what, what I'm going to say now is the following. Imagine I have some state rho. Okay. Then, um, and this has some amount of entanglement. You give me a measure like formation or whatever, you give me some measure, and, and you tell me that this has a certain amount of entanglement, 0.57. I'm going to use the fact that pure states scan all the numbers, real numbers between 0 and 1, which means the following. I can always find a pure state, psi 1, which is an epsilon above this guy according to this measure. Because pure states, uh, by changing alpha and beta, I can get any number I like between 0 and 1. So you tell me the number, and I'm going to choose alpha and beta so that I get an epsilon above you. 
And then I'm going to choose alpha and beta so that I get an epsilon below you. And I'm going to use the famous theorem called the sandwich theorem. In some countries, the theorem of two policemen, where these two limits are going to squeeze the guy. And they're not going to give him any choice. Yeah, I don't know which particular version you use in this country. Police would be more exciting than the sandwich. Police not good to make any jokes, I suppose, about it. OK, so now, here it is. I've got this guy, and I've got the other guy on the other side. So I can always find that, because these states already cover all the real numbers between 0 and 1. So they give me every possible number I can get. So now I have a mixed state. And now I say, OK, give me another measure. And let's suppose that the two order in the same way. So my assumption is now that they order things in the same way. So I've got E prime, psi 2, E of rho, E prime, psi of 1. Okay? But actually, for pure states, all measures have to agree. They are all equal to the reduced, to the reduced guy. Sorry, this is also prime. This line is completely prime. This means this is equal to that, and this is equal to that. And if I squeeze these guys more and more, if I let epsilon, you know, you can write this guy, if you like, as E of rho plus some epsilon. And this is E of rho minus some epsilon. As I let epsilon go to zero, as these size approach the value of this guy, then because they have the same value for both measures, they're going to have to squeeze them equally. So if they order the states in the same way, the only conclusion is that they have to order them in, not just order them in the same way, but give exactly the same number, because this number hasn't got any other choice. So they coincide. And I showed you at least one couple of measures which don't coincide. What is the conclusion? That they don't order the states in the same way. That's the only supposition I had. Again, the same logic. So I suppose one thing, and then I it. And now I'm proving it in a way that this has got to be that way. So if you do your PhD and you discover yet another measure of economy, great. I mean, you shouldn't be depressed because there is lots of space for new things. Of course, you know, is this going to be useful for anything under the sun and so on? It's not, uh, it's not entirely clear. So like I said, the whole thing <coughs> becomes much more interesting when we talk about many body entanglement. And we'll talk about that as well from the more formal perspective in the fourth week. But I think what's really going to be interesting is when we start to link this to, to real experiments and showing how we can actually measure this. And once I, once I try to convince you that 10 to the power of 23 atoms are really entangled in a physical system, then you will probably start to doubt less and less uh, the existence of dead and alive cats and all the other objects in this universe. And that's the beauty of physics. Um, now I'm going to switch. Um, so you know, this place is, I guess, as good as any other to stop, given that there is much more to be said anyway. And what I want to talk about a little bit now is, is really start in the next half an hour to introduce the notion of computers. And um, um, unlike Unlike, unlike information uh, theory, which somehow is intuitive to physicists, theory of computation is phrased in a, in a way that it takes you a little bit of time to get used to the way that these guys uh, in computer science think. So I want to say a little bit about classical computation. So I'm going to play the same game. You know, I started with information theory. I explained a little bit of quantum mechanics. Then I quantized the guy. Then I said there was much more than that. Now I'm going to start with classical computers. And then I'm going to introduce the basic gates and so on, and then I'm going to quantize it fully and, and tell you the difference. Um, there's a lot to be said about this, actually, um, in some sense, uh, because, because it's, it's a very unfamiliar way of thinking uh, to, to a physicist. Um, but I will really squeeze it, and I will give you as much as you need to know for, for what follows. So, so in classical computation, um, it really, classical computation started in, in the way that, that you would imagine it should start, which is, which, is, which is with people like Leibniz and Newton 
um, uh, who basically complained that they had to do lots of calculations day in and day out. Leibniz has a statement where he says that it is very disgraceful for a person of the intelligence like himself to have to do the basic pedestrian work of calculation. I think we all sympathize with these kind of statements even if we are not really Leibniz's ourselves. Um, Newton went through something like 200 pages of calculations per day and this was during his most productive years when he invented calculus and gravity in two years. He was 22 basically to 24. Uh, I really am the <laughs> Anyhow, um, the point I'm making is that you can imagine that the design was immediately there. As soon as you had high level mathematics and something more complicated than three apples plus five pears and you owe me five goats for what I gave you and so on, which was all the way up until modern mathematics, up until Newton. After that, the calculation really started to become very, very intricate. I'm being a bit unfair to the ancient Greeks, of course. It was already intricate and so on. So, um, so people started thinking, how can we, can we get a machine? Can we get a boring machine? So once you set up the problem, again, it was clear to to people of the caliber of Newton and, and Leibniz, that you, you could really feed it into, into some robot. I mean, the intelligence is in setting up the model, but usually um, you can probably imagine that you could solve this without, without any human um, engagement and intervention. So the first guy who really took this idea seriously is a, is a very well-known guy uh, called Charles Babbage. So Charles Babbage, um, uh, I think went to uh, Queen Victoria, and, and he said, "I've got a, I've got a, I've got an idea for for this uh, for this uh, calculating machine that can add up and multiply and so on." All the basic arithmetic was there, and it was very fast in the sense that it was much faster than than what any human can do. Uh, and he said, that "The only problem is that I made a very small version of this computer." which is just to demonstrate the principles, but if you really want a larger one, you have to give me X number of uh, British pounds. And of course, he was denied this. You know, this is a familiar story to all of us who have to apply for funding every once in a while. So he wasn't given the money, and in fact, there was no computer from Charles Babbage. Um, Babbage's computer sits now in the Science Museum in South Kensington in London. It was made some five years ago uh, just to show that it really would work. Um, and so it exists now, but of course, uh, Charles Babbage died a long time before that, and he didn't live to see it. But the idea was there. Um, when, you, when, you, when you really want to talk about the next big, big thing in computer, so Babbage already showed that basic arithmetic can be done with that. Uh, the next development would have to come, in a sense, to show that what is the totality of things that this guy can do. And, and I think probably most people would agree that the first decisive step there was taken by a guy called Turing. Uh, so you can see that in Britain there was this very long tradition of, of thinking about how to avoid doing boring things and how to be lazy and intelligent at the same time. Uh, and uh, which is actually very good, I think, if you can practice it uh, consistently. And, and Turing, but Turing came with a deep philosophy as well. You know, now we read his. Uh, papers, we don't read his papers directly, you read a textbook which distilled his ideas. Uh, but I think it's always, and I really encourage you to do this, it's always good to go to the original source. You, you will understand the spirit and you will understand what the person was going through when they were thinking. And you will understand much better why they were doing what they were doing, rather than reading uh, uh, an end distillation of the same of the same work. So Turing, Turing was... Um, Turing had a very bad time in the UK. He was effectively killed uh, because he was a homosexual and this of course was not tolerated and is still not tolerated I guess in many societies but uh, he received a formal apology from the Prime Minister last week of, of UK which is a great news I suppose. Turing must be very happy and he's great. Um, um, so he was, uh, he was basically not appreciated for his contribution either to computing or to the war effort. He was great on cryptography. The guy actually broke the German code in the Enigma machine and was instrumental to the Allied effort. In fact, he's much more known for that in, 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 in his home country, I would say, than, than for computing. Now, uh, what did he think? 
well, he really had much grander ideas. Um, of course, he wanted to define a computer, but he actually wanted artificial intelligence. The guy really was, uh, I think, uh, I think uh, uh, someone in his family who was very close to him died at some stage. I don't know how old he was. But this prompted him to think that it would be very nice to be able to pre preserve the personality uh, of this family member for as long as it takes. So he had grander visions. And most of these great guys thought very great thoughts. They didn't think about how do I sum up one and two and four and things like that. So, of course, he wouldn't necessarily expose his paper in that way because it would be rejected immediately. Although, he did have some papers along these lines. But the idea was, can I transfer the brain capacity of a human being into something that's going to do the same? And for that, he needed to have a good model of a human brain. And that's called the Turing machine. We think of it as a good model of a computer, but he really aimed higher. Whether he failed or not, I don't know. Tell. So he thought that mental processes work very much like computers. I mean, this was all well before any computers existed, so he, of course, invented computers. Uh, and, and he was then thinking, what are all the possible operations that you can do? And I want a machine that's going to do that. And on top of it, he, was, he, was, he thought very much like a physicist, even though what followed, like I said, uh, differs quite a lot from the way we think. So he thought, what should I actually allow this guy to have in order that he can compute anything that I think can possibly be computed? Um, and, and, and so he thought about it really as a physical machine. And this is this model that's called Turing machine, which I can tell you a little bit about, but it doesn't matter. You don't need to be able to manipulate it and so on. So he thought really in terms of a basic memory, it was already a physical model in the sense that it has all the physical parts. So he had some kind of tape. Um, and unlike us physicists, in many ways he was very wise and he of course discretized the whole tape because he, know, he knew that continuity leads to some kind of infinity and you're never going to finish your, jobs, your job if you have to do continuously any things. So this is a discrete tape and each of these uh, states can be zero or one. So also he understood that 0, 1 alphabet is a universal alphabet and you can do everything with this kind of stuff. So each of these guys can contain, um, contain one of the two numbers. And now he needed, he needed something that's going to change these zeros into ones and ones into zeros. And that's of course what, what he thought happens in our head. Um, and, and he said, okay, why don't I have some scanning device? You see, he really called it like that. I mean, it's really as physical as it gets. He was making a model of, of, of a human brain. So he has a scanning device, and this device is going to somehow observe what kind of value exists here. And this device also can have some, some internal states uh, inside, uh, inside. H stands for the head of this device, if you like. I mean, you can call it whatever you like. So, so basically, there are some internal states. And what the machine really does is all it's allowed to do is, is delete and write things into, into, into the squares. And it's allowed to move to the left or to the right based on what the machine did. And at the same time, change the state of the head. So these are all the operations. They're very simple. All of this requires some kind of bit flip, since each of these numbers can be either 0 or 1. And you can only move to the left or to the right, which is also a bit value. Everything is really now constructed out of discrete um, bits of information. And the idea is that you really put some input here. You put some sequence of, uh, of numbers. That's the so-called program on a modern computer. And then this head starts to work, you know, you press the button, the head starts to read this number, and depending on what the number is here, the head changes these numbers and then it decides to move left or right. Okay, it's just, I'm just telling you how simple it is. It doesn't really matter uh, if you remember this or not. Um, and, and his claim was that at some stage by doing this, after some time of going left and right and whatever else, uh, so this was the basic version, there are many many more intricate versions which are similar. You know, there will be some state of the tape where you will write your output out. Okay. And his claim was, um, this is something that's known as a, as a church uh, Turing thesis because Alonso Church uh, worked about, uh, at these problems at the same time. Their conjecture, which is why it's known 
uh, church, as a church Turing thesis is that anything that's computable can be computed by a Turing machine. Why is it called a thesis? Because you cannot prove it. In the same way that you cannot prove any physical law. You see, the guy really was a physicist, I would say, although he probably will be insulted by me calling him a physicist. So, so, you know, this is like the second law of thermodynamics. You cannot do that. And if you tell me, prove it to me that I cannot do it, I can't. I've been trying for 200 years and I failed. And that means I have to elevate it to a big principle. You cannot do ABC. But I can't prove it to you that you cannot do it. It's a good working hypothesis. Maybe tomorrow someone violates this kind of stuff. It's the same logic. In fact, you invert this in the same way that we invert other laws. And if someone says, what is it that's computable? Then I say, anything that this guy does, I define to be computable. That's a nicer way of talking. So now I'm, I'm stating the, the thesis as a matter of fact. It's just, it is like that. Okay? It's a definition. Again, time will tell whether this is true. Quantum physics, as you will guess from what I, what I will say later, shook the foundations a little bit. Is it clear that this can do anything that, uh, that, uh, that quantum mechanical systems can do? I mean, so far I've been claiming that quantum mechanics is very different, and the results we've seen are very different. So can the Turing machine really compute density matrices and so on? As far as we know, yes. Quantum mechanics doesn't cure this idea. It's really interesting. It's stupendously slow, okay? Super slow. You would never do it like that. But actually, you cannot find anything that quantum mechanics can do, but this guy cannot do. If you really think of a human brain as a classical computer, as a Turing machine, then we do this kind of boring st stuff, right? We try to simulate on a piece of paper, and in our labs, the way that physical systems behave. So you see, it really fits nicely the vision of, of Turing. Now, fortunately for us, somehow in parallel with, with Babbage, there was a guy called George Boole, who invented Boolean logic, of course. The guy was a primary school teacher. All of these guys have very interesting histories, actually. And if you see all the number of accidents that lead to things, amazing. So he had to teach something like eight hours a day. But somehow he had the ability to teach and think about something completely different. I guess when you're in a primary school, you can afford to do that. I don't know. I find, I find it very difficult to do that uh, here and now. Anyhow, he thought about his Boolean logic. He was probably telling them something, one plus one is two, and then he really thought about, about bigger ideas. And, and he produced, actually, uh, the, what he called the laws of thought. Okay? He also was sure that he was describing, in many ways, human thinking. You see, all of these great guys, it's similar ideas. Artificial intelligence is the game. And so he said, I'm going to capture the laws of our logic. He was wrong, by the way, unlike Turing, okay? He got it wrong, I guess, the big deal. So he said, I'm going to capture, I'm going to have some, some statements which can either be true or false. So my logic is going to be composed of propositions. And this propos proposition is something that I define that is true or false, okay? So Britney Spears is the best looking woman in the world. It's not a proposition, because it's a matter of taste. You may find it so, I probably don't. So in that sense, this is not a good proposition, okay? But Brasilia is the capital of Brazil. I think it's definitely a proposition. A true one could be false, but it is, it is a proposition. That's what this guy was using. So you give me propositions, and now I tell you how to combine them. And this is the, the, laws, of, the, the laws of Boolean logic. And one of the key laws, actually, the whole logic rests on one law, which he phrased amazingly enough in a great physical way. I mean, this really, this to me is, is amazing. He says like this, if I think about one proposition and the truth of that proposition, such as London is the capital of Great Britain, and then I think about another proposition, such as now it's raining outside, then it makes no difference in which order I think about that. The whole truth of the proposition is invariant uh, with respect to this. So when I first think about rain, and then I think about London, the combination cannot change in value if I change my thinking. And of course, you're smiling now, because this means commutativity. And this means quantum mechanics could not care less about it. Okay? So Boolean logic doesn't work in quantum mechanics. So this was the proposition A and B. Is the same. He phrases it like that. 
he doesn't say, I introduce some product and then I He really says, if you think like that and then you think like this, you could also think like this and then you could think like that. He has a temporal evolution of his logic. It's fantastic. It's beautiful text. And it's beautifully wrong as well. As far as we have understand, That's going to be the key difference, of course, between, like, between classical and quantum computation. For us, what matters is that George Boole came up with a different model of a computer. It's actually a nicer one than this machine. This machine is very cumbersome to work with, and you cannot really get much done with that. So what George Boole said is, you give me, you give me some sequence of zeros and ones. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply my laws of thought to calculate with these guys. So I'm going to tell you the, the, the rules according to which you're going to combine these guys to get your output. And he, in some sense, also, he anticipates uh, Turing in the sense that he shows that all sorts of functions that you want to compute can just be computed out of these very simple um, operations that he constructed. So all of, all of us know already what he was doing. He was doing things like um, zero and, you know, he was doing like proposition A, if you like, and the proposition B is one connection. And he defined this as a gate. He said the table of this guy is that unless both of these guys are true, in which case the whole thing, if you like, is true, the rest of the possibilities are, are, are basically untrue. Uh, so if, if any of the propositions in this connection fail, the whole thing has to, has to fail in totality. Okay? Then he had a statement which was somehow, in a way, the opposite of this, which was an OR, which was an OR gate. Okay? So for an OR gate, it's enough that one of them is true for the whole thing to be true. So this only fails, zero means fails, of course, in my language. This thing fails only if both of these guys are untrue statements. Then the OR connection also, this is like a gate. In a minute, we'll think about these guys as gates. This guy also fails. The rest of them are true. So this is not quite like the human OR in, 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 in many languages, because one OR one would also be wrong in a human language. When we say OR, we really mean one or the other, not both of them. But if both of them are true, this is also OK in, in this kind of logic. And then he constructed 16 different, well, he didn't construct all 16 ones. There were many other people later. So he constructed them, and then he said, now I'm going to manipulate, manipulate my, my sequence here. I'm going to start with some sequence. And now I'm going to introduce something like end between these guys or between these guys. Maybe I'm going to negate some of them. So negation is another famous operation where, where like the not gate, if you like, inverts the bit value and it's represented as the dash. Sometimes you may see it written like that as well, negation of zero and one, whatever else. There are as many as, as you like. And and the interesting thing, so okay, the upshot of the whole of the whole of the whole discussion then is that he showed that in fact there are universal sets of um, uh, of connections or um, ga of gates, if you want to use our language now, uh, that will compute anything that can be computed. So that's the analog of um, of, uh, of Turing statement. So Turing thought I could basically compute any function with this, and George Boole also said if you give me these connections, if you give me enough of them, I can also compute anything that's possible to compute. So you give me a function which takes input into some other input, and you define it for all bit values, then I can show you that you can start with a sequence of all zeros, and you can achieve this kind of stuff, much like, 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 a, like a computer should do. And for example, if you have an AND gate, and if you have an OR gate, and if you have the NOT gate, this certainly set is a universal set from which you can, you can, you can prove all the other ones. You know, there are, there are things like equivalence relation and implication and all sorts of other gates, all of them can be constructed. They're not primitive gates. They can be constructed out of your basis set of gates. The interesting thing, and this again relates to computation, is that there is a universal gate. You don't have to have three gates. You can do it with one of these gates. There are many universal gates. There's a two-bit gate, there's also a three-bit gate, and so on. And these are the things that will 
will start to translate. So somehow the picture that George, George Bull came up with was, was much easier, I would say, to manipulate in some sense. And certainly from our perspective, quantum perspective, these guys are much easier to quantize and upgrade to a computer than to quantize a Turing machine. People still actually debate how exactly to quantize a Turing machine. Uh, the difficulty lies in the fact of saying, can this now be a qubit? Okay, yes it can. Can this guy be a qubit? Okay. But when you come to the point that this guy can move left and right at the same time, which is got to be a natural consequence of quantum mechanics, many people get a little bit nervous about it. Okay. So it seems that you cannot make this fully consistent under certain assumptions. And it's much safer, I would say. Although classically these are the same version, equally powerful. It's much safer to go into this kind of stuff. And, and so basically that's, that's, that's what we are going to really start, uh, start doing tomorrow. We will have some kind of input of bits. And I'll introduce the basics of that. And then these con uh, connections between bits are really going to represent some kind of boxes which are going to be gates. You know? So here is gate 1. Here is gate two, and so on. Any 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 bit can interact with any other bit. And at, at the end, so this is the input. At the end, you will have some sequence of bits, which is the output. Okay. And and this is now known as the as the circuit model of computers. And you can show formally that anything that this guy can do, so can this guy, and vice versa. So effectively, George Ball and Turing themselves showed that already. If you follow the logic of their reason. Um, so what, what I have to now tell you about a little bit as well, but I think that's, that's I'll give you just a preview of, uh, of that uh, because I'll leave the rest for tomorrow, is before I quantize it, I have to introduce, I have to introduce um, another um, hierarchy. And what this is used uh, for by computer scientists is really to talk about difficulties and different problems. And that's the interesting one for us because I know I want to somehow make a, make a statement that a quantum computer is more efficient than this guy. And in order to tell you that, I have to describe to you what I mean by efficiency. How efficient is this guy? How inefficient? So it's not enough just to say it's universal, but it requires an infinite amount of time, you know, the age of the universe to compute. Yes, in that sense they are all equally powerful. But if you ask me how quickly really, can you do it in, in, in a brief time or, or does it take too long, then, this, then you have to zoom in a little bit and start to ask, uh, start to ask um, uh, better questions. And what we are going to start to do tomorrow is exactly that. So what we are going to do, and again, Bohr's version of the circuit model is, is better for that, is we are going to start with something like n bits um, input. And we are going to ask about two things. How many bits do I need to solve this problem? Again, it's a very physical question. Actually, when you think about this as a physicist, you immediately see the limitations and how to extend it. This can be extended in many ways. I don't know anyone who's doing it, but they should be doing it. Okay. Actually, I think David Deutsch is doing it. You, know, it you say, I have n bits, and the question is, how many, how, how big is this n for a given problem? So the, the, the first question is the size of the memory to solve uh, space. People call it space. Okay? How many bits of memory do I need to solve a certain problem of these n bits? The second is, of course, time. How, how long does it take? How does time scale with n? And how does space scale with n? And now you say, but this, is, this is primitive. Why space and time? Because they couldn't think of anything else. I mean, these are the two basic resources. But of course, as physicists, you immediately jump up and you say, what about energy? Do you think it takes a lot of energy? They have no idea in computing. They don't know what energy is. They don't know about space and time. No one told them about energy. Okay? They didn't study thermodynamics. These are mathematicians who do these things. Okay? So basically, if you ask me for anything else, what about precision? Okay? My space and time scale nicely. But I have to have an infinite precision. Is that good? Is that efficient? Of course it's not efficient. So there are many other resources that you should take in, into account when you're sitting in a real lab. 
that these guys are not sitting in a real lab is one statement. The second statement is it's very difficult even with this to give any, and that's the real problem. Even when you think about this, you don't know how to add it because even the classification with respect to this becomes extremely intricate. And that's exactly actually what I want to what I want to address tomorrow to show you what kind of problems exist out there. Any questions? We have beats, logical gates and Turing machines. We know that in Christ we can do computers using transistors and everything. Yes. But what software engineers do, it's work with language like C, Java. Yes. And in quantum computation, do we have and like quantum language? Is that so that's study? a great that's a great uh, question actually, and I think um, I think we haven't got to that stage experimentally yeah. where people are really required to write genuine quantum software. And you are absolutely right. Uh, the way we, we think about quantum computers still in a very limited way. So the way we think about them is, is through some kind of classical interface even, right? So I'm, I'm going to make it even worse than, say, than, than to say that we haven't really thought about this. There is an extra level there where we mainly use quantum computers to show that certain classical tasks are more efficient on a quantum computer. This is the same level that I was talking about using quantum states to communicate quantum messages. But then I showed you that there is a whole lot of communication <coughs> outside which cannot even be captured within Shannon's theory. We don't know what's outside. You know, we don't know what we don't know, if you like Donald Rumsfeld's uh, convoluted language, okay? Uh, and basically, that's the point here, that now you ask yourself, what if I want to step away from this classical idea? So I put in three, I put in five, quantum computer gets me 15 faster than anything else. Great, okay? But that's a very limited set of tasks. Maybe I want to ask a quantum computer, here is one state, here is another non-orthogonal state. Discriminate them. Maybe I want to start shoving in entanglement, and, I, and even the way I'm writing a program is an entangled thing. Yeah. It doesn't even have the analog for Turing. You know, we're stepping completely outside of that of that problem. And in fact, the answer is we don't, have, we don't know how to do these things. We haven't even thought about that, how to encode that. We really think about factorizing numbers, searching a database. All of these are classical problems. They're tailored for classical things, okay? But we don't even know, you know, there's, a, there's an infinite space of possibilities outside of that, where the input is genuinely quantum, the computation is genuinely quantum, and the output is genuinely quantum, because that's the way it is in this universe. So we don't know how to write software for that. <coughs> that. That is one thing that I thought something like, we don't have an idea of language because we are like, we don't know much things about quantum computers because we don't have quantum computers to work. So I agree that there is a practical uh, pressure which does not exist yet in industry in the sense that we don't have more than let's say 15 qubits in some, in some implementations. So no one is yet even thinking about hiring people who should now start to program this guy. But I think even when they start to program it, they will program it with the classical physics in mind. Whereas what they should really do is even ask more general set of questions. And we haven't even started phrasing these questions. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. So that's why I said, so you know, Basically, these are the things we, we don't even know that we don't know, in some sense. You know what I mean? We, we know that there are certain things that we don't know. I'm paraphrasing again uh, the, the favorite Secretary of State, I suppose. Uh, but these are things that we can't even anticipate, because we don't, we don't know what's outside of this domain. People haven't even stepped outside to, to think about it. It's very limited at the moment. I think if the industry kicks in, then you will see people getting paid specifically to sit and just to think about that. And this is now missing. There is no industrial pressure forcing us to do that. Yeah. Whereas with classical computers, there is a huge number of applications. The money depends on it, and of course, that's when it becomes very really interesting. Yeah. Very good point. The former statement here. Uh, could you give me uh, some explanation about the four 
sitting in the phase transition? Ah, so in a phase, yes. Again, a topic I will talk about uh, in this many body and time on it. But just to make it very briefly, is that is that in a phase transition? So phase transition means you change some parameter um, in your system. Usually, people think about temperature. I reduce the temperature of my system, and suddenly, at some temperature, something exciting happens. Whatever this means. I'm, I'm being as, as vague as possible, just to maintain the generality. So there is some criticality. <laughs> And, and usually what happens to, what, to quantities we call order parameters. These are the guys that behave in a discontinuous way at the phase transition, or there are some kind of jumps. Either they are discontinuous or the derivatives are discontinuous, and that's how you classify these guys. Basically, what this would mean in this picture is that entanglement maintains some level uh, for certain amount. I should probably draw it the other way around in some sense if it goes down. But here, so ordinary order parameter would, would do something the opposite, but we're talking about entanglement which is presumably high at low temperatures. This is not always true, by the way. But then as you step uh, and basically outside of this domain, suddenly there is a there is a jump in entanglement uh, here. So if you plot, you know, if you plot the derivative, if you like, of entanglement, you will see you will see a discontinuity there. Um, um, if Frequently, we cannot really tell how low the entanglement is, again, because it's a complex system. Sometimes when we get lucky, this is really a perfectly sharp transition, like that, and then it goes exactly to zero. And then that looks a little bit like magnetization, for example, in the icing model or whatever else. And I think you can show that entanglement is a pretty good order parameter for most of these systems as well. That's why I said, that's why I said you know, uh, continuity is fine, everywhere here, unless you're really at the point of criticality. Because if you change the state by a little bit, suddenly you've got down to zero amount of entanglement. But this is only in the thermodynamical limits, strictly speaking. This never looks like that for a finite number of systems. It always looks smooth, like that. That's a typical curve. And then you take the thermodynamic limit only to show that it really exhibits. But of course, m tends to infinity does not exist in nature. You never have infinitely many atoms. That really does not exist. That's not an issue for a physicist. There is no discontinuity. Uh, is there uh, some direct correlation between the quantum sharp bounding and the relativity? <laughs> Good point. And I think there is a. Uh, there is, a, there is a relationship. I just have to think of, of one or two papers that talk about it. I think if you give me a little bit of time and you ask me tomorrow, I will, I will pick out papers that, that discuss them. I think there is. The answer is yes. You can relate them directly. And you talked about the difference between the entanglement of formation and the entanglement of the installation of a system. That you almost can use that to quantify the mixedness of the system. Why almost? Or the, this, no, this, this difference is, it is an interesting quantity. Ah, almost because again we encounter some kind of super additivity in this in this uh, way. So whenever we break, it's, it's a good point. And again, I can only offer an intuitive reason why I think this is like that. Um, you, so you can calculate and you can show in particular cases that there really is a difference. So what, what you want to know, ideally, is, is that entanglement of formation is the distillable entanglement plus entropy that you have to use to uh, erase Alice's memory. So ideally, you'd really like this to add up to this guy and account completely. But what we find is that, is that we have something like that. And this is, this is very related to trying to even divide correlations in the first place into quantum and classical. And what I said is that for mixed states, these guys never really add up somehow. So if you break correlations and, and, you, and you say, I'm not going to look at total correlations, but I'm going to look at one subset and then I'm going to add another subset, and then you always find out that you are losing things when you are doing that. So here, here you are dividing it into entanglement between two subsystems and entanglement between Alice's memory and the two subsystems. You know what I mean? And somehow you are losing. So you can think of this as, as, as three, as three um, 
three body environment, if you like. So here is uh, Alice's head, and here is the cubit that Alice holds, and here is the cubit that Bob holds. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say that this entanglement here plus some kind of correlation that Alice has. So I'm dividing it in this way, then I'm dividing it like that. And I'm trying to say that all should be captured by, by the formation entanglement. But because I'm already, it could well be that the very fact that I'm trying to trace things out and divide somehow leads to, to an extra quantity. So it's not, so maybe it's okay that it's additive, that it's an upper bound. It would be nice to find a way of really, a, a, a reversible way of doing this, so that you really <coughs> confidently can stay there. That would be very good. That would be perfect, I would say. But you don't think it's possible? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. You have to find Entanglement of formation and entanglement of tessellation taking LOCCs as uh, no, operations. So, can you Very good. define them with another operation, one general, yeah, absolutely such right. that equality holds? You are absolutely right. So, a so, uh, uh, person who I understand will be coming here very soon, uh, Fernando Brandao, is, is the person who's thought more than anyone else about this, and I think he's written a very beautiful paper on that topic. Um, they're actually very difficult to, to show what he showed. Um, and, and in fact, if you enlarge your set of operations, then you really can go into a regime where, where, uh, where you can show some kind of uniqueness of the, me of the measure of entanglement. But what you've done is you've really, you've given up this, this, this physical notion of local operations and classical communication, and you've given it up by quite a lot. So, you had to actually, you had to enlarge the thing twice, in some sense. Already the first enlargement would make lots of people uncomfortable, but then even that doesn't work and you have to make it into a second enlargement. So basically he, he first took separable operations and said, what if they are not locally executable, but I just require them to be separable, A times B? Then you cannot do that. And then he said, what if I take operations that preserve partial transposition? Positivity. And that's an even larger set. You can so show the other guys a strictly speaking subset. And then you can churn out the, the conditions and you will really get some kind of unique measure of entanglement um, for mixed states. But, but then what you call entangled, or what you call disentangled, is no longer what we call separable here. Then you have to acknowledge that your background is now already composed of entanglement. You know, you're not measuring it with respect to what we think is not entangled but with respect to something else. So it's a, in a way, it's a big price to pay if you're thinking in terms of information processing, but what you really gain is that uniqueness. So is it worth paying that price is the question. But the papers, independently of this, are very beautiful, actually. Yeah. It's a very good question. About bound and pending. When you do data compression, you project to the typical subspace. Yes. Um, and then you will have uh, uh, a lot of bell pairs. Yes. Actually, like that, you define distillation in your book. Yes. This means that I can't compress the, the bound entanglement uh, state. Uh, the yes, that's only yes. It means that. So that's only one protocol, and you can try that protocol, and you will not get any entanglement because anything that has the structure of A tensor product B, in, in, in you know, in pure state compression, it's even simpler. Alice does something, Bob doesn't even do anything. So I showed you in a, in a way that you cannot ch change the positivity of your state through operations like that. So whatever the sign of this guy is, positive or negative under partial transposition, it has to be conserved under operations of this type. And what I showed is that the data, you know, Alice does data compression, call it D. Bob doesn't even do anything. It's a very simple case of, of this very general operation, which also completely fails. This, it's even worse than that in, in some sense. The, the data compression doesn't even work well for, for general mixed states. So, in a sense that it doesn't give you 
the maximum that you can get. So not, not only in bound states, but even if you go into states that can be distilled, it's not always the best strategy to do local data compression. I will talk a little bit about better strategies in that because some of them will also involve very simple quantum computations like control knots, Hadamard's measurements and so on. And then you will see how distillation works out nicely. So hopefully I get a chance to convert all of that into some kind of uh, computation and even show you how to do this uh, uh, in, in, in the lab. That's it. So we need to